Welcome to The Common Denominator, hosted by me, Jason Eve. Each week, I invite a guest that is vastly different than me in any way, and hopefully by the end, we find something we both have in common. Or in other words, a common denominator. Today on the show, I am joined by Mark Sargent to talk about the Flat Earth Theory. Welcome to the show, Mark. Yay, thanks very much for having me. Mm-hmm. I guess the first question I have is like, kind of, do you have like a brief introduction about yourself? Because obviously, you know, you would know a lot more about yourself than I would. So if you want to just give a brief introduction about yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am a Flat Earth recruiter. Mm-hmm. So if Flat Earth was a metaphorical university, Mm-hmm. The chances are you are going to run into my stuff first. I, my stuff is the 101 book that's that's out there uh, because it's the easiest to understand. And that's what I built. Oh, wow. Back in the you know, six years ago, beginning of 2015, I made a series of videos on YouTube that said that uh, I believed in the flat earth. And here's why I laid out my points and it kind of grew and grew. The, the short version for people, it's like, oh my, I, you know, that don't have any idea what flat earth is. Um, you are not a person sitting on a tiny little rock covered in smoke and water flying through the impossible uh, vacuum of space. You are in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And it is, there is no space, as far as we know, because we haven't been outside of this world. And that's even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until almost 1960. And when they did, they just decided to keep it a secret. We didn't build it, but we're sure not going to release what we know to the world. And there you go. Gotcha. Yeah. And I guess the next question is, um, for someone like me, uh, I would consider myself very much like, a believer in a lot of the science we see in the world um, mm-hmm. like i go to a high school that specializes in science and technology so i think this is a really fun conversation to have because i oh like sure it's a, it's a really big debate um i've seen pop up a lot of times but i guess what would almost be like your elevator pitch to somebody like me who doesn't necessarily believe in the flat earth and what would like the quick points you would kind of give to them okay I'll give you the uh, the same bullet points that I gave to the physicist out of Georgetown uh, some, some years ago. There was a German television team that came to me and said, hey, is, give us your five best science things that you can throw to uh, any sort of physicist. And I was like, okay. Well, you know, I just came up with five on the fly. So here we go, real fast. Uh, number one, you can see a lot farther than you should be able to. And there's like that has really changed with the advent of HD technology. Meaning, if the curvature of the Earth is eight inches per mile per mile, or eight inches per mile squared, when you look off the distance, boats go over the horizon. We all know that, right? They go off into the horizon, and you don't see them anymore. And that's why, because they go over the hill, over the side, you know, on the other side of the ball, hmm. at least far enough to where you can't see it. Well, that's now not true. Now with HD technology, that boat's gone to your naked eye, and now you can crank up you know, cameras with big zooms like the uh, Canon P900 or the P1000. Mm-hmm. And these boats now come back into frame, and they're perfectly clear, and you can see them from the hole on up, and you know, they're not hidden by anything. And we, I put the challenge out to all sorts of people. I said, look, find me, in fact, find me an object at 150 miles or less, because the atmosphere gets pretty thick after that, that uh, that you can't see number two would be gravity versus the vacuum of space and i know people they don't like me using the word the power of the vacuum of space but you when you want to say it's a pref uh, uh pressure differential fine it doesn't really matter I, you want to try to out nerd me go ahead uh but what i'm saying is is that vacuum the a vacuum versus gravity a vacuum will always win you know, something as small as sucking your soda through a straw, you know, which is a very weak vacuum force, to putting a vacuum chamber above your head. It's not like the movies, you know, where you, you get this this hole in the fuselage and, you know, going out to space. It's like, we only have two minutes of air left. Get the duct tape. That's not how it works. At the end of, the end of Aliens, the movie with Ripley, yeah, everybody dies. And they die in about, <laughs> at about a quarter of a second. It is not like the movies at all. And so if you put a vacuum chamber above your above your head right now and you pull the valve on that thing, what happens? It's going to be instant. It's going to be violent. And uh, the pressure is going to be extremely, uh, you know, it's going to be like that. 
And the question is, why didn't the gravity in your room keep the air from going upstairs? And, and it's simple. It's because vacuum will win. Well, when you walk outside, why is the atmosphere still here? Why are you still breathing? And your, your knee-jerk reaction will be 100%, well, gravity. I go, you mean the same, the exact same gravity that was in your room, that couldn't hold the air in your room from going upstairs? That same gravity is holding everything on this planet. And you say, well, yeah, it has to be. It has to be the only explanation because uh, we, um, if without it, you know, we'd be dead. And it's like, well, unless it's a pressurized system, unless you're living in some sort of building, mm -hmm. you know, where there's actual air pressure, because that's the only way you could get air pressure. It, it, anything else defies the law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. which says that pressure can't exist next to non-pressure without a barrier. Gravity is not a barrier, but we'll move on. Mm -hmm. Number three which would be the eclipse shadow is too small. If the moon, according to science, is 2,000 miles wide, then why is the blackout shadow, when you see it crossing some terrain down here, why is it only 70 miles wide? And you can come, go into all sorts of fun optics and say, well, it's, a, it's like a shadow, but like a magnifying glass, where it's a focal point of a shadow. It's like, okay, first off, it's something we can't replicate here unless you're using a lot of complicated optics. Uh, you know, you, you will never walk next to a building. Your shadow will always be exact size or longer. It will never, ever get smaller. Your shadow doesn't become the size of an action figure. And you say, what's the point? And I go, my point is, is that we say the moon is only about 50 miles wide, so, which would make the 70 mile wide blackout zone pretty much what we expect. And science has a tough time with it. And even if you say, if you, even if you can convince me with the optics, all right, well, then why don't we see a shadow of when the, when the, the Earth is in front of the sun and that shadow should be cast on the moon? Why don't we, because remember, the Earth is 8,000 miles wide four times. Why don't we see a 250 mile wide blackout zone on the moon? Hmm. We never ever see it. The, Earth, the moon should turn into a giant eyeball. Never does. Fourth would be the moon temperature which was fascinating to me because I didn't even know about it until like a year and a half into this, which is the moon generates a cold light. And people say, well, you mean it's colder at night? I go, no, no, meaning it's, it generates light that's absolutely the opposite of the sun. Meaning, uh, it, we all know when you walk out in the sun, you know, 80 degrees in the sun, 70 degrees in the shade because whatever object is blocking some of the sun's rays. Well, when you're in the moonlight, it's a flip to that. It's the opposite. And what I say, it's like, what do you mean? I go, well, meaning if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's 60 degrees in the moonshade, always. In fact, you get, if, if it's a full moon, it's high in the sky, we've seen up to 13 degrees swings Fahrenheit. And you can check this at $20 point and click infrared thermometer. Uh, you can buy it down at a hardware store. And you, and you think, well, no, that's, you know, residual radiation. It's like, no, 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 no. We've tested it with all sorts of stuff, copper strips on water, but here's where it gets even weirder. You take a magnifying glass to moonlight, it even gets colder than normal moonlight. Just blows, I, I have not found anyone in the science field that will even touch this one. They don't even know it exists. And it's like, yeah, we got videos all day long about this. I, did, I didn't come up with it, it was brilliant. By the way, does that prove a flat earth? Nope, no it does not, but it absolutely destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. You know, the moon's supposed to, you know, reflect some of the sun's rays. Well, you should be neutral at most. It should never go negative. Ever, 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 ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, and by the way, a cold laser light, we can replicate that in a lab today. We, you know, you can change the frequency on a, coal, on a laser beam and, um, and chill things with it. You know, not like Mr. Freeze and Batman, <laughs> but you, you can still think, make things. In fact, they use it in um, cos cosmetics. Uh, health, different health surgery type stuff. I, I didn't even know it existed. I had to look it up. Mm -hmm. The question is, why is the moon doing it? Uh, and last but not least is the, um, the Van Allen radiation trap question, which is a simple question. You can ask anybody. It's like, okay, Van Allen radiation belts. If you don't know what it is, it's uh, belts of radiation, really big and thick, announced by Van Allen, go figure, who worked for NASA in the 50s before the space program was even firing up. Are those, he said they were super, super deadly, right? No one should ever, ever go up there. You, you'll all die. And so are they deadly? Yes or no? Simple question. Well, if you say yes, then how did the Americans make multiple round trips in the late 60s and early 70s with no shielding whatsoever? 
to, to protect themselves from, from this radiation. They used aluminum and plastic. The only things that can stop radiation are um, lead, gold, and a whole bunch of water. All these things are really, really heavy and, and dense, and you can't use them on spacecraft ever. It's like putting an anchor. It, it's terrible. It's a terrible idea. So how do the Americans make it? Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Uh, there's still nobody got cancer. There's still five of these guys limping around today. I think there's five. Pretty sure. I don't think there's four. And if you say, well, okay, they're not deadly. Oh, okay, if that's the case, you can go to the NASA.gov website and look up a wonderful video they made called Orion Trial by Fire at the end of 2014 where they said, Orion, by the way, is the Mars program, which is never going to happen, uh, which is, oh, yeah, by the way, we can't test man capsules because we haven't solved the Van Allen radiation problem. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, you solved it already perfectly. You never had a single hitch. And you forgot how, how to solve the problem? What's, what would happen? And again, that video is still out there right now. It's not, we didn't make it up. Somebody, you know, we, we just searched the internet for stuff. Anyway, I sent those five questions to uh, the, the guy from Georgetown, and he just folded. That was it. He was like, yeah, I'm not doing this. And, and to be fair, I knew he wouldn't because scientists, when they, when they get to a certain level, especially if you're an astrophysicist, uh, you you have certain disciplines. You know, you're very narrow banded. You you're not going to talk out of your wheelhouse because you don't feel like you're qualified. And it's very unsatisfying to us. It's like, look, take a shot, take take something. You know, come on. You took a lot of classes. You got to have some sort of opinion on this. And he wouldn't. He, he would not touch it. And that was it. And the Germans went home, and uh, I was that was the end of it. And mm-hmm. I have yet to run into anyone that uh, could. could you, and again, you, you might be able to throw something at me on one or two of them. You're not going to get me all five. I mean, I, I, I'm just a high schooler taking physics right now, so I don't know if I'm like the best in terms of science for this. Oh no, no, it's it's okay. Well, it's actually good because you haven't gotten far enough to where the conditioning is irreversible. Uh, I did an interview with people full blown, you know, just got their, I mean, the, the ink was still dry on their PhDs from uh, Toronto just recently. And I was hitting them with the same sort of stuff. And they were just parroting back. You know, again, remember, it's fresh in their heads. I mean, everything that was textbook. And I felt bad because there was nothing I could do. All they knew in their lives. I mean, there's, there were like 22, 23. Mm-hmm. No, in this, in some of the cases, I think 24, 25 for your PhD. Mm-hmm. And all they knew was textbooks. That's all they had. That, that was their entire lives. You know, they they don't know anything about relationships or emotions or <laughs> any sort of trials of their lives. All they know is textbooks. And there was nothing I could do for them. You know, they, they might as well have been robots. I mean, I might as well have been asking questions to Siri because that's all they were coming back with me. It's like, oh, no, according to this, this is the correct answer. It's like, okay. Fine. Do you want to use the Neil deGrasse Tyson line, which science is true, whether or not you believe in it? Go ahead. Uh, science has been wrong so many times over the years over so many big things. Uh, anyway, so there you go. Yeah, I guess um, one really big theme I kind of picked up throughout all of that is that it almost seems like there's a lot of, I guess, mostly at like, I guess, educational system, for example, um, how there's not necessarily what would I call it like a distrust of the educational system or suspicion of the educational system and like how did that really come about and what is its relationship with kind of like the flat earth community as a whole I guess well what we realize well at least what I realized but some of my comrades in arms would, would say the same thing is is that especially with the American education system mm-hmm. is that they teach you the bare minimum. You know, we've heard these stories over the years, you know, like some people when they got out of high school, it's a, it's abysmal how little they know. Uh, but what we found out is we're barely taught enough to you know, get a basic, jo- unless you're getting your master's or your PhD, you're just enough to get a basic job and drive. <laughs> That's it. Uh, you know, the reason why the moon missions, you know, they, they passed off so much stuff, it, it, you know, just breaking the laws of physics in, in, in certain cases is because people are taught almost nothing. When they get out of high school, they, they, almost, they remember almost nothing, if, if they even took it, of biology or physics or engineering or chemistry or any of that stuff. And that makes sense because the majority, I mean, you, depending on what sort of high school or people you've been in, you know, friends with, you know, the, the math club and the chess club uh, and the physics club, they're all very small. 
compared to, you know, the other thing, the football team, <laughs> the glee club. Wait, is there even a glee club anymore? It doesn't really matter. That's old school. The point is, is that those groups are very, very tiny by comparison. And what happens is, is those people, yes, they will go on and, and read more textbooks and, and, re, and that becomes their own echo chamber. They reinforce their own things all the way up to a certain level. But what they have forgotten, and the reason why Flat Earth has, has gotten to the size it has, is that we created a way to explain the world that was easier than the solar system model. And your response might be, well, just because it's easier doesn't mean it's right. And I go, no, but it means that more people will catch on to it because people love easy. You know, people, the, the old Asian saying, which is uh, people are like water. You know, they always take the path of least resistance. That is so true. Uh, you look at, and you're old enough to remember this. I mean, well, maybe not. I mean, people people used to run up massive cell phone bills just talking on their on their on their. This is before smartphones, mind you, on um, just their cell phones, just huge hundreds of dollars a month in cell phone bills, just talking, 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 and then text came out, and it was emotionally easier to deal with people in text than talking on the phone. So, what do you think happened? Mm -hmm everything transitioned and all the people that were worried about the lawsuits you know, because there were there were lawsuits coming down the pipe because they were like what happens if somebody puts a cell phone up to their head for 20 years what happens we never found out and so but that's what that's what happens and so yes flat earth is easier to understand and that's all it really takes people want easy answers to things and we gave that to them i said look and you know we said this the, the flat earth model is just a, is an easy, simple model, and it was the old model for thousands of years. And I don't care if you say, oh, the Greeks knew. It's like, yeah, fine, screw the Greeks. <laughs> Not all of them knew this. And, and every other society, they drew the exact same thing. They drew a snow globe. Why? Why did they draw this? And it's like, well, that's because that's all they saw. They didn't have a space program. I go, oh, do -do -do. really? Because here's, here's the problem. Sorry, and I know I rambled, but oh, no, sorry. you're letting me. <laughs> so <laughs> let, let, me th let me throw this in there, which is George Orwell, right? He had this great, great quote in the, uh, the late 40s, which he said, and he was not a flat earther, but he was talking about how people just believe science just because. It's like, well, they got a lab coat. They must be credible. <laughs> Insert picture of Bill Nye here. <laughs> Who's not a scientist. No, he's an actor. He's an actor. It's like, oh, no. And, and they put him, CNN has him on all the time. <laughs> tell, tell us about quantum physics. It's like, okay. So, uh, sorry. Where was I going with this? Just people like <laughs> gravitate towards things that are easier? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people, uh, yeah sorry. People, people gravitate towards, towards things that are easy. And because of that, we have resonated to the point where we don't, let me backtrack for a second here. Mm -hmm. Science, every, people believe science just because of this, the George Orwell quote. I'll end this little ramble with this. George Orwell said, if you walked up to anybody on the street and you said, hey, how do you know, you know, where, how do you know it's a globe? Their first reaction is almost instantaneous. Like, well, pff, are you kidding? We know it's a globe. It is known. It, we know. It's no, and then you you push them on it just a little bit. And you say, "Really? How do you know?" That's when their gears start grinding because all of a sudden people realize that they don't know because they they have a spaceship or a rocket program or anything like that. They know because they've been told. Remember, this was in 1946, I believe, and and NASA wasn't founded and even founded until 12 years later. How did everybody in the world know it was a globe in 1946 if there's no space program? And you say, well, geometry, I go, Boo, geometry, most people don't know anything about geometry. They were just, somebody just put a globe in their classroom and sat there for 12 years, assuming you made it out of high school, mm -hmm. and that was it. And, and people just bought it, generation after generation after generation. So the question becomes, if you find out, let's say 1960, after civilization has been built, do you tell people if you're wrong? Science, they would have to, they have to admit some things when they're wrong, but science, I think, can keep secrets. And we're not talking about all scientists. We're talking people at the highest levels of power. It's like, do we tell the public? It's like, no, nah, I wouldn't have either. And I, I'm one of those weird conspiracy guys that I believe in the greater good. 
And so, you know, it's not like, no, the people should know at any cost, you know, let, you know, if shut the heavens should fall. Otherwise, it's like, come on, it's like, you don't really believe that. Hmm. So anyway, there you go. I think this reminds me of a YouTube video I watched. Um, did, did you watch a YouTube a video from the channel? I think it was Johnny Harris's channel. I was talking about the Flat Earth. Maybe. What was the what was the point? It was basically um, the premise was he kind of talked about like the history of Flat Earth. Um, talked about like parallax stuff like that and then he got into like his kind of ending thought was almost that flat earth i guess is so popular because it involves things you can like sense with your five major senses right you can yeah. touch you can see you can like the evidence is very very clear to understand which there's like a lot of the same arguments that you're making but yeah. i think his main point was like as science becomes more intangible as like for example physicists get more into like quantum mechanics, string theory, kind of yeah. very, very abstract concepts. People yeah. want to go back towards those main five senses and go to something that's easy to understand. Yeah. And his kind of argument was, is it good to go back to easy if it's potentially not true? And I was kind of wondering, what are your thoughts on like uh, kind of things like that? Do you think that it's more beneficial to go back to things that are easier to understand, even if it means that we are kind of slowing down the boundary of science getting to more like complicated oh, and theoretical uh, things yeah yeah yeah. i can answer that in two two paragraphs uh the first would be nikola tesla mm -hmm. well let's talk about the people that that he, he was basically saying that the one of science uh scientists real problems is they build on people's work they only stand on the shoulders of the person right below them and they never revisit anyone below that going all the way down to the foundation and he goes that's a he goes that's a real issue because when you get to a certain level you know how many tiers up 10 15 20 whatever he goes when you get up to those levels he goes there there are so many assumptions made by the time you get up there that the foundation was was absolutely everybody was right absolutely perfectly right by the time you got to yours he goes he goes the chances of that happening are, are very slim so he goes by the time you get up there your equations are meaningless in terms of credibility because you're just it's all assumed uh again yes yeah, so the people that are working on on quantum mechanics and string theory and i mean heck, every every astrophysicist that's spending their life right now trying to trying to define dark matter right mm -hmm. dark matter has had more uh, credible things put in science fiction movies than what we we've, we've come up with uh, but as far as what you're saying, you know, going backwards, you know, I, I will say this, as I got into Flat Earth, I relearned more science than I ever remembered in, uh, in high school and university. Way more. I mean, you want to call it remedial learning? Sure. Sure. Why? Well, I mean, why not? I mean, we, we could, and the reason is, is because everyone that gets into Flat Earth hates it. Everybody tries to tear it down. Everybody tries to, to destroy it. Nobody gets into Flat Earth thinking it's a great idea. And so they go to their science books and they go to NASA and they, they lean on everything that's science and they realize that things, you know, that these vast rooms full of scientific knowledge and especially the NASA side, uh, you know, the, the space exploration, you know, you, you're thinking there's volumes and volumes of information. They're just empty cardboard boxes that are just labeled with assumptions. That's all they are. Uh, it, it never, and, and believe me when I say this, I have run into people I mean, I was very, very stubborn, but I didn't have a lot of uh, content to work with that was out there. There are people now that they, I mean, one of my favorite guys, uh, channel DITRH, he would ban people off his channel just for bringing it up. <laughs> and he was a conspiracy guy. And, you know, he can talk about all sorts of conspiracies. And, and I said this, and I don't know if you listen to the clues, but I wasn't kidding. I had, I had friends that were like, oh yeah, the entire royal family is made up of lizard people. I'm going, really? I go, let me tell you about this flat earth thing. To be like, get the hell out of here. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like, what about the lizard people? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But you are way the heck out there. And that showed me I was kind of onto something, which was the conditioning uh, was so strong that even, um, you know, even the most outlandish uh, conspiracy people were laughing at flat earth. And I mm -hmm. thought, I thought it was brilliant. So, mm -hmm. And then, that kind of gets into another one of the questions I had is, I guess, who would be kind of hiding this truth for us? And what would the motive be for that? Like, why even? 
Why bother? Yeah, why not yeah, tell like people? Why bother, you know, saying that the Earth is a globe and trying to hide, you know, if we're assuming that, you know, flat Earth is true, why try to hide it from the public? You know, what is the motive behind that? Right, right, right. Uh, the, f the, the, the one word answer is timing. <laughs> timing is everything, as the saying goes. And yeah, you could have brought it up to the public hundreds of years ago and would have been fine. Most of the public didn't even know how to read and write hundreds of years ago. But if you bring it up in 1960, and you know, in your, your opinion, you, you might be one of those people. It's like, no, I'd go out and tell the papers right away. It's like, yeah, you haven't lived long enough to remember what used to happen. Look up something called Roswell. <laughs> the Roswell thing, when that hit the papers, people were freaking out, right? And that was just a stupid spaceship that crashed in New Mexico. All right? This is not, it's not what they stand to gain. At that point, it's what they stand to lose. So in 1960, everything's built, right? The cities are built, the infrastructure's built, nations are already separated, we've got a pretty good balance going on, things are fine. And then you're going to tell people, oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> the world isn't what you think it is, right? Don't, don't forget um, Neo's reaction in The Matrix. I know that seems like an extreme example, but hear me out. So it would be a three-pronged thing. First off, every university in every country, and there are a lot of universities out there, thousands and thousands of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, think about that. Astrophysics and astronomy in all those universities would have to be closed until further notice. Those aren't even reopening. And then the remaining physical sciences, I don't know, biology, archaeology, uh, hydrology, geology, you name it, anything with an ology on the end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the ologies have to be retooled. Uh, libraries have to be emptied and refilled. We're talking about academic chaos. That's just the academics. Economically, you'd have to close world markets for months to figure out what it all means and what the implications are. Uh, you know, the, the world markets are twitchy enough, enough as is. You know, this is talk, we're talking about something that, unprecedented. But the big one would be the, the spiritual angle of it. You've got the five major religious houses of the world, um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. You're giving them all leverage against science simultaneously, and you're telling them to show restraint. And you, you don't forget that science has been beating them over the heads with textbooks for at least the last five centuries. They're pretty bitter about this. They they would come back. It would never end. It'd be like, okay, so tell me about evolution again. Tell me about carbon dating, the Big Bang theory, dark matter. I don't know everything you guys ever came up with, because you were wrong about this. This is a pretty big thing. It would be you know that is a short as far as who uh, we'll just call them the Illuminati. How's that? Uh, it'd be the shortest Illuminati meeting ever. <laughs> People would be saying like. Yeah, we're going to table this until we can figure out how exactly we're going to let the public know and make it, maybe use it to our advantage. As far as who it is, I'm talking about a very, very small group of people who probably know everything. And as any conspiracy person will tell you, mm -hmm. nobody knows who's at the top. That's, that's the greatest part about being the puppet master is um, that the first rule of power has never changed. It's not Murphy's Law. It's the first rule of power is stay hidden because you can't be overthrown if they don't know who you are. So, which is why it's a, this great shell game. You know, who's at the top? Is it the Illuminati? Is it the Bilderbergs? Is it the Rothschilds? The Trilateral Commission? The Vatican? The CFR? Or Jewish Cabal? The Masons? Just keep going on and on and on. You know, no one knows who, who's at the top of this food chain. I mean, I was getting a d debate the other day with a guy who was saying, oh, yeah, it's got to be the Rothschilds. I go, the Rothschilds is, a, is new money by comparison to some of the old people, you know, the really, really old families. They, I mean, the, the Rothschild fortune thing has only been around since the Battle of Waterloo. It's, it's not that not that old. Anyway, those guys, those would be the ones that keep the secret, you know, because you want to keep society going in the direction that you want it to go in. Now, is this information useful? Yes. Could you use it to your advantage? Yeah. Uh, the, the question is, though, what do you do with it? I'm not, you know, it's hard to, hard to say. I mean, we're, the infrastructure, there could be a reason why you're talking to me now. Meaning the topic has been just, just ramping up and ramping up for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And could it be that they want it to be released? Possibly. I mean, we were promoted for three years straight on YouTube. I mean, just promoted constant, you know, just... Da, 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 da. 
So yeah, I think there's so, I think we're, there's something else to it. I think you know the infrastructure is there: high speed internet, social media, six billion smartphones. You now have the ability to push any narrative you want mm -hmm. and make it seem credible. Like I don't know, you know, there's a virus going around killing everybody, <laughs> and we've got a cure. But that's a whole other topic for another time. <laughs> Definitely another topic. Yeah. I just hmm, I found it really interesting because. Uh, you know, I, I, as I said before, I go to a very like science and tech heavy school, but I'm also really like involved in like international stuff, po pol political stuff like that. Um, kind of interesting to see both sides of the topic. Do you think that, cause for me personally, like as somebody who is very, you know, uh, I would consider myself a lover of science personally. Um, sure. Like and by the way, I'm not anti-science, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I think kind of the one of the first impressions I got out of you was that um, a lot of the times I feel like we look at flat earth people like they believe that everything in our life is a lie. And I think from this conversation, it's it's not entirely that, you know, there's still many, many things you and I hold to be true together. Um, probably like many biological stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, well. Yeah, let me let me finish that thought for you. Uh, here, here, here's where the disconnect is. You want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water at sea level is? Yeah, sure. I, I can go there and get a pan, fire, temperature thing, <laughs> test it right now, figure out what elevation we're at, and, and figure out how you know, it decreases as you get it higher. Um, you want to tell me what the core of the Earth looks like? Ooh, now you got a problem mm. because the, the core of the Earth is, you know, the, supposedly it's 4,000 miles down to the center. Where the deepest hole ever drilled, it's not 2,000 miles, it's not 1,000, it's not 100, it's not even 10, it's 8 miles. So why are we seeing all these perfect cross sections? Never even occurred. You know, when you're growing up, you see these perfect cross sections of, of red and orange and yellow and white center. And they're perfectly 1,000 miles thick and nobody even questions it. Mm -hmm. And then you read in the small print on Wiki, it's like, yeah, we have no idea what's down there. <laughs> we're, just, we're just extrapolating. It's like... Yeah, but you show us the diagrams, and then you show us the cross section of Jupiter and Saturn. And it's like you haven't even been, or even claimed to have been there. So what the heck are you doing? And and that's because science has a tendency. They they don't like putting question marks into textbooks. They don't. I mean, the Earth, they, the cross section of the Earth in a text, which should be the Earth with a giant question mark in the center. Hmm. And they're never going to do that. They're hmm. never ever ever going to. They're going to because science will put their their stamp on it and say this is what it is and my saying my quote that i came up with is science is true until the day it's not it's mm -hmm. the the part that drives me nuts about science is that they never apologize when they're wrong they just readjust <laughs> the 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 books mm -hmm. you know they, they it's like well it's now it's repeatable it's now under the banner of science and it's like really the double slit experiment really <laughs> you have no idea what's happening with a double exclusive experiment, only recently with computer simulation. So we kind of got an inkling of what's happening there. But it's like, well, it's repeatable. So it's science. It's like, oh, you guys are killing me. I guess Stop. I mean, yes, of course. I, I, no, I love science too. We're talking on you know, the, the, the technology we're using right now. Fantastic. Uh, you know, I grew up in the tech field, taught tech support for 20 years. Loved science. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I still do. But you realize once you get to a certain stage, and we'll get into the auto hoax thing in a second here, mm -hmm. is that science, they're just men, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're, fa they're fallible, they're corruptible. People think, well, there's only corruption in business and politics and sports and entertainment and journalism. It's like, boy, because scientists aren't going to take the money? <laughs> of course they will, especially for corporations. The, the corporate ones are the most blatant. You know, America, we've made amazingly dumb decisions when it came to products because we bought off the scientists you know scientists yes when they start out everyone's pure right and all of a sudden it's like yeah the scientist thinks it's like there's a briefcase of money it's like yeah you know what i could use a new bmw and they take it and and it's like and then all of a sudden you know oh lead paint that's a great idea lead gasoline ddt all the variations ddt asbestos which i actually think is a good product you know unless you work in the factory and then, uh, oh, I don't know, the scientists that took the money in, in here in the States and said, oh, smoking, totally fine. In fact, we got doctors lined up to recommend it for you. Uh, anyway, sorry, go ahead. I guess that also kind of leads into another question about almost the nature of science and like the scientific message. Because like for me, um, 
the scientific method seems very sound like you uh build off of one thing or another even if they're assumptions but uh i feel like that the current you know setup of the scientific method that has been used for a long long time uh, yep has in my opinion been pretty sound because even if you build off assumptions and things that may not necessarily be true if yeah. you have consistency when it comes to like repeatability and stuff like that across you know different trials and it makes sense in this moment then yeah. you're able to apply that to the current knowledge you know and then once you get to new stuff that you don't know uh and once you get something to explain that you it kind of like slowly opens the boundary and even though what you have maybe temporarily true and not necessarily the full truth it's still like extremely useful That's you are you are correct absolutely the scientific method uh, the short version is test observe repeat mm -hmm. there you go uh, which yes and does it opens up doors and it gets people going down a path and yes you can expand and, and a lot of the times you're right but when it goes wrong science is not quick to backtrack uh, especially if if they've got a lot of the foundation stones already built uh, I'll give you a, what was one of my favorite examples out there. And, and then, of course, assumptions are made by the wrong people. Uh, Lord Kelvin. You heard of that guy? You, you know what Kelvin no. is. Uh, Kelvin. Sounds familiar. Isn't that a... Like, well, a I mean, Kelvin, you know, the absolute temperature. It's named oh, af after yeah, the guy, yeah. Lord Kelvin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, oh. Ke Kelvin. No, oh, no, no, you know this guy. Yeah, yeah, Kelvin, right? He's, he's known for absolute temperatures. He's one, one, of, one of the fathers of thermodynamics, right? Yeah. You know what else he's known for? You know what his 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 kind of thing science doesn't like to talk about? I'm curious, what is it? He was the guy that said, "Yeah, airplanes are never ever going to happen." Right? Mm -hmm. And he was saying this while airplanes were being built. He it, his fact is one of his quotes was, "I have absolutely no faith in the aeronautics society whatsoever. <laughs> it's a losing horse." That's like, "Oh man." So and and by the time he died, of course, you know there were you know there were planes prototypes being flown all over the place, and but he did not see. And people have said this over, you know, like again, people make their personal biases or whatever. His in his case, his discipline clouded or tinted his vision of what was there. No different than I don't know the 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 creator of FedEx got like a C C minus in the class in the university class for even proposing such a thing because the professor is like oh no never never gonna happen you know um but the science the scientific method yes it does work no no question we we use it ourselves you know we we didn't know what the hell we were doing we went down to the beach started shooting stuff we didn't know what we were doing when we were shooting lasers and and doing all that all those fun things uh but just because it's repeatable doesn't mean that it's an absolute. Uh, I use the um, the the coelacanth fish. Uh, it's a perfect example. C o e l a. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. the really old fish, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the really old fish, right? <laughs> extinct, extinct seventy million years ago. Everybody knows that extinct seventy million years ago. Why wouldn't they? There's so many other fossils. They're extinct. They were right in so many other fossils. So they made the assumption that this was one of those. It's like, oh yeah, fish has been dead for 70 million years. Mm -hmm. And so when the British government caught one off of South Africa in 1938, they're like, no, you know, the denial, first response always, nope, 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 that's definitely not it. And then they caught another one off of Mozambique and then a Madagascar. And then eventually, I mean, it took several years before the scientific community was even willing to, to, to look at it. That's the, you know, they're really slow to backtrack on stuff. So, no, I, I agree with you. Scientific method, very helpful. A lot of good things about it, but like anything, there's, there's flaws. And, 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 but they don't, uh, science, it's the arrogance when you get up to a certain point, which is why uh, science hates flat earth so much because it just flies in the face of, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an affront to them. I, 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 it is tough for us to even talk with full-blown PhDs. I mean, the, the Toronto thing, for example, where I was talking to those, mm -hmm. those brand new PhD students, there were supposed to be four of them in the room. Two of them couldn't do it. <laughs> Two of them were so upset about the concept because remember, it, it makes their education you know, basically worthless mm -hmm. in some, some cases. They, they, they're they like, nope, we are not going to look at it. And that's just mm -hmm. straight up denial, which is fine. Again, you know, I'm a fairly open-minded guy. 
Mm-hmm. But it took a while. I was the same. I was the same way. I hated it. I find that so interesting because I guess you can like consider me almost like a quote unquote young scientist. I wouldn't consider myself a scientist, but like the mindset I have, I guess you can consider as that where, you know, I don't mind if something conflicts with, you know, what we have established, then it would be like, not only like, I would be open to it, but also like maybe possibly even kind of fun and interesting to maybe look back and maybe even do some sort of breakthrough. Um, do you think it's, uh, I, I don't really want to call it cynical because that's almost like too negative, but do you think it's kind of like a more negative, I guess, view on kind of the nature of people and the nature of like the scientists that they would prioritize like their own kind of education and stuff above possibly making a breakthrough or researching maybe a little bit more into this? Do you think you're having like almost too much of a negative view on the scientists that are working in this field or? Well, no, no, no. It's not, it's not a negative. It, Whoa, you still there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. Hang on. You still there? Yeah. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, you still there? Yep. yep. Okay, good. The uh, Sorry, we had a power. The wind is done, but we must have had a branch that, well. Uh, I, anyway, we'll see. If, if it goes down now, I won't be, probably won't be able to yeah, reconnect. Yeah, there's a storm it, near my house too, so we're anyway, both dealing with well, no, in this problems. In this case, it was me because my tuner tip, tripped for, for a second. Anyway, hopefully not again. So, um, no, it's not a negative view. I don't look negatively on the scientists themselves. They are just a product of their education. It's, it's unfortunate because when you get up, I've had a number of friends in the academia world, you know, some high level academics. I've helped put a PhD through school. And what happens is when you get up to that point, your priorities change. Meaning when you get up to, especially when you start going for your PhD, all you care about is your uh, your status within the community and being published. That is it. And the, if you look up the word ostracized, ostracized is most often used by academic institutions. That's that is the where you know where you hear it more often. You know, it was, it was ostracized by the <laughs> by the by the physics community for whatever reason because of my view. You know, they. It is, talk about your peer pressure. It is, it, there's so much money you have spent to get there and so much time and so much is cranking on the books. By the time you get there, it's like, all I want to do is fit in. I don't want to lose these friends. I want to hang out with these people and I want to get published. That's all they care about. Anything else that comes in from the outside, if it's below the bar that they have set, which is very, very high, then they don't even want to address it. In fact, the peer pressure. I have talked to, to people that won't that won't address it from an academia side because they are afraid of what the community might do to them. If they do, they do address it, even if they're coming after us. And the reason is you don't want to be the guy, and Evan said this for a while, you don't want to be the guy that walks into a, a debate with Flat Earth and you've got all sorts of credentials you if you don't knock us out in the first 10 minutes no one's looking at us anymore they're looking at you mm. it's like a boxing match it's like wait why is he still sta- why is he still standing what are you doing wrong you're obviously scr- you're embarrassing us and that's it that's 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 the thoughts that go through their head and they're like nope nope not going to do it uh which again the phd out of um the, the physicist out of georgetown i i knew he he thought it was a great idea in the beginning and then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, I don't want to do this. And they and and I have run into other academics that they try to sleepwalk into a debate. They try to sleepwalk into the discussion. It's like, well, I can knock it out in two seconds. So like, no, you know, you can't because we already tried. That's the difference. That's the part they forget. They think that flat earthers are just tinfoil hat people that got into the topic, thought it was a great idea since minute one. And we hit the ground running. That is the exact opposite of what happens. We go into it. With the, the t-shirt literally reads, I became a flat earther because I tried to debunk flat earth. Hmm. And when you, because we tear it, and the reason why there's so much conviction on our side, the reason why, you know, I hardly get an original question anymore, is because we try to tear, we tear down the globe ourselves, brick by brick. And when you do that, which is why our retention rate is so high, when you do that, how can you put it back together, even if you wanted to? So no, I don't. I don't hate academics at all. I mean, I, I wish they they would. You know, I'll give you a. Let me end this ramble with this. 
the Toronto, the, there was a point where the, 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 the girl from the Toronto University, mm -hmm. she said, because I said, look, until you guys come up with a, a, with a way of making it simpler, we're just going to keep winning by attrition, right? Mm -hmm. And she goes, why do we have to make it simpler? That's not our job. And it's like, well, there you go. That's the answer I was waiting for, which is it's, it's beneath them. We don't have to make it simpler. We spent all this time and effort and education to get to this level. Why do we have to lower ourselves to your level for this discussion? I go, you don't. I, in fact, I give them the playbook. I say, you, you don't have to do any of those things. But if you don't, the general public, which aren't you, you know, the general public, which was everybody in the high school that wasn't in the math club, hmm. we will get them. And if you don't do it, so I, I go, look, you want to stop this? This is how you stop this. If you don't, great, fine. But at least you've been warned. So no, it is it is not disdain. It is not anger. It is, it is nothing along those lines. Uh, I, I, it is straight up conditioning, I, 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 which is why I, I don't like talking to anyone that has a master's degree or higher if they're under the age of 30. Because they're just, there's, they, they don't have anything else to balance it with. So, sorry. Anyway, there we go. Because hmm. let me think about that for a little bit. Because what you kind of said towards the end was really interesting as, like, why should they be in the position to make it simpler? But kind of thinking about it a little bit, um, if kind of Flat Earth gains a lot of its, you know, popularity, especially with, like, the advent of the Internet, being able to share information extremely yeah. rapidly, if it gains a lot of popularity through, like, uh, simplicity or a simplification of the current science we have right um i, I guess for me uh you know I, I admittedly i'm like one of those like mass club kids i'm very like into stem uh that whole field now uh, just trying to kind of like think about the simplification of kind of the high level science because for me uh there's a period in my life i think it was like middle school or something I really wanted to get into like really high level science because it's always been like a dream of mine to do something extremely cutting edge, you know, something really theoretical, something possibly along those lines. And uh, I kind of, in a sense, almost empathize with the person saying that, why should we go simpler? But it also kind of like raises some questions of, hmm. If, yeah, if, but no, I, I hear you. And I have heard this before, but if they don't adjust to what is happening out there you you we've seen this in business how many times mm -hmm. right if you don't adjust to the surroundings to the to the climate around you you are going to be uh, there will be the whoever's your opponent is will have the advantage and so and, and i'm not saying you know try to make quantum physics easier because you're not going to. <laughs> it's just, there's only so much you can do. I mean, there's a reason why geometry and trigonometry and calculus and all the quantum mechanics are all broken up into separate things. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying when it comes to <clears throat> just the basic, the, what they, they've lost touch with the general public. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need some water. Um, which is if they don't come up with a schoolhouse rock version of everything, everything that is out there. And you don't have to go into string theory. Because no one's going to understand that anyway. Uh, the, but the other stuff, the basic principles of, you know, how supposedly your solar, solar system works and, you know, get, and answering some of the questions that we put out there. Because the, 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 all right, let me back up. I don't, some of science, what, what's happening out there is not science's fault. Meaning we, the, the internet hive mind, which is really big on finding plot holes. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean like moviemistakes.com. Yeah, any production yeah, that yeah. has come out, right? I don't care what it is. The back, the bigger the production, the worse it is. You're always <laughs> going to find production mistakes because movies are shot out of sequence, and there's just we we can't catch all the details, and so the details are caught by the internet in the end. It's like, oh look, there's a guy in the background. Oh look, there's a car in the Shire, <laughs> which there was. Um, you know, oh look, that coffee cup moved. Um, that shouldn't happen with real life. You know what I mean? So it should never happen with the news. We shouldn't be able to find mistakes in, in news reports. We shouldn't be able to find uh, things in historical documents, like everything that NASA has put out. So when we start saying, hey, what about this plot hole? What about this plot hole? What, what about this plot hole? 
and science comes back and says, well, you're just crazy or you're an idiot or you're ignorant. That's not a rebuttal. You know, I, I've told people, I say, look, yelling's not a rebuttal. Profanity isn't rebuttal. Um, um, name calling isn't a rebuttal. You got to come up with something. If you don't come up with something, we're going to run with it. You, you have to come up. If we ask a simple question when it comes to a plot hole, you know, something that looks wrong with the historical documents or the science books, you know, something in comparison. The big thing, the big problem is we're looking at historical documents and we're tying them to the science books and which has never really been done before. And so science is trying to play catch up, but they're not even trying. So what do you do? I go, but if you don't do that, what do you? I'll give you a quick one and this off topic, but I got to bring it up really fast. <laughs> this this will make sense. So when Sanjay Gupta from CNN comes on and he says, well, the, you the conspiracy people have been yelling about the MMR vaccine, right? He goes, he goes, yes, there's this massive uptick in autism, right? In the United States, especially huge uptick. It went from one in f what, uh, 10,000 to one in 40. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? He goes, but it's not the MMR vaccine. He goes, what it is, we don't know, shrugs his shoulders. It's like, yeah, sorry, you can't just say we don't know and shrug your shoulders and good night, everybody, and roll credits. You can't do that. You have, to, you have to give something along those lines. So when we ask your people from aerospace and, and scientists, we say, look, what about this hole in the story? You can't come back with, well, you're just an idiot. You just cannot do that. Uh, or we're just going to say, okay. <laughs> Uh, opponent chooses not to answer the question we will assume that he either doesn't want to you know doesn't want to answer it or it just reinforces what we what we have anyway go ahead yeah it's interesting because it's almost like you guys are I, honestly i'm not too too involved with this whole flat earth debate um yeah. but what it sounds like at least from your point of view is that kind of the community is asking science oh Where's the proof for this claim that we present? Uh, and the science community is kind of going, uh, because we already know from the Greeks that the Earth is round. We don't. Have there to you go. That. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Again, the um, or or even the more modern stuff, which is yeah. You want to do the yeah. The Greeks say there was a sphere. It's like okay, even if the Greeks did say it was the sphere. They didn't even, couldn't even map out a, a fraction of the world because the, the new world hadn't even been discovered yet. So what, what exactly, yeah, fine, you want to say you could draw a globe, but you didn't know what was on it. But that, again, that was the Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, the, a simple question would be for us, like here's the vacuum versus gravity thing, tell me what happens at the bleeding edge of space. Tell, tell me what happens. You know, where, where our atmosphere ends and space begins, tell me what happens there. First off, tell me exactly where the barrier is. You know, where it, you know, wh what happens there. And then why, because you were, you were the ones, here's the thing, when you set up, science is the one that set up the rules. We didn't come up with the curvature of the earth formula. And we did also didn't say, come up with thermal dynamics. Thermal dynamics says pressure cannot exist to non-pressure without, without a barrier, mm -hmm. period. It's not a guideline. It's not a rule. It's a law. It absolutely happens that way. A million times out of a million times, you blow up a balloon, let it go with your finger. It's going to fly away from you. Why? Because of the pressure difference. So what happens? I mean, the, the girl from Toronto, she was great in, in that she goes, well, there's so few particles out there that, that there isn't much of a pull. I go, yeah, if, if vacuum was discriminatory and it was only going after the, those few particles and ignore all the massive amount of particles that are behind them, it, it, that's not how it works. It rips everything. It doesn't care. It's going to rip everything off the world, including probably the water. So anyway, sorry, I ramble. Yeah, I was kind of, hmm, I'm kind of curious because I'm learning physics right now. Uh, yeah. Honestly, apology to all the physicists out there. I do not represent like the larger science community. <laughs> I'm just a high schooler who's taking <laughs> physics right now. So I'm going to try my best with my basic physics knowledge, but kind yeah. of, I guess uh, I didn't want to get too much into the science, but kind of interested in it now. But um, kind of my interpretation of you know if gravity were to work, right? Uh, we're learning in physics. We're actually learning right now a lot about like uh, like points and forces stuff like that. So you know force that we deal with a lot in physics class, FG force of gravity. Um, you might have a problem with that, but 
we're just going by what's in my textbook right now. <laughs> right. Uh, but if we kind of consider FG of gravity um, ha has a force, if we're assuming gravity have, has a force here, right, right. then uh, the each individual particle, if we're talking about like the edge of kind of our atmosphere or even like the moon or satellites that are orbiting us, right. uh, is exerting a force inwards. I'm just trying my best to come That's up with a right. scientific, scientific explanation. Um, but if it has a force inwards and, you know, if we're assuming gravity has a force outwards, then I guess the logical thing would be that either the force of gravity and uh, the vacuum is balanced, therefore it doesn't move, uh, just orbits, stuff like that, or the force of gravity is greater, so it, you know, keeps it in. Actually, technically, the force of gravity would be greater if it was orbiting because that would account for centripetal acceleration. Hmm. Trying to remember back to what I learned maybe like a couple months ago. Right. <laughs> If I yeah, like a like right. a geo like a geostationary satellite that would be balanced hmm. because so if we it's treat like every particle of air as a as a satellite with a force of gravity in, and if we consider the vacuum almost as a force, like pointing yeah. out, I guess the logical thing would be that force of gravity is greater than the force of vacuum. It, sorry to Mr. Elder, my physics teacher, if I got any of that wrong. <laughs> that no, that's okay. The, yeah. But my earlier question does apply, which is. Why didn't gravity keep the air in your room when you had a vacuum chamber upstairs? Well, and you, and you say what? And, and you can't say well, it's a stronger power of vacuum. It's a stronger mm -hmm. order of magnitude of vacuum. It's like no, it's a small vacuum chamber. Mm -hmm. We're talking about space, which is massive. And again, to the particle question, because I know anyone that might be listening to this, uh, they might be saying, well, you know, the girl was right. There's so few particles out there. Okay, here's how it would work. Um, I'll give you a great example. Let's say you have a cardboard box in front of you. Simple experiment. Uh, let's say it's an Amazon box, right? And it's empty, mm. except for the packing popcorn. Got a little piece of tape on the bottom, right? And you lift it off the floor. What happens? Nothing. The, the cardboard box keeps the packing popcorn in there. Why? Because there's packing popcorn doesn't weigh a lot. There's not, it's very light. It's not a lot of density. I go, fine, put the box back down, put a couple pieces of paper on top of the packing popcorn, and then put heavy, heavy books in there or bricks or whatever you want right then pick up that box what do you think happens well the, the books are just going to push everything out in front of it and everything's going to fall to the floor yes why because gravity in this case doesn't discriminate neither would the vacuum of space so anyone that says well there's almost no pressure differential when you get out at 600 miles it's like yeah wouldn't matter because the vacuum's not stopping at those little flaky little ends. If you thought there was a bleeding edge of space, it would go after everything. Mm -hmm. Would it go everything behind it? And you're like, what's the point? My point is, why doesn't it go after everything? And you say, what? your only answer, I get it, right? This is what physics, this is the textbook stuff. Only answer is that gravity is stronger than the vacuum of space. I go, that's the only answer. It cannot be anything well, actually, else. Actually, um, I did a quick search right now. Yeah. Uh, into this question because honestly I was just curious of what kind of on, what the internet on, says kind of what the greater you can call it scientific community or like people who know a lot more about the subject in terms of like a more like strictly traditionalist scientific view right. um, looks like the answer actually is that I think it's pretty interesting is that air pressure is caused by by gravity itself so Reason, yep yep so Gra gravity as a barrier yeah i've heard yeah. this yeah. bottom of the ocean is more pressure top of the ocean oh. is less pressure you know stuff like that same yep. thing with like the column of earth's atmosphere right down right. here we have more air pressure up there we have less air pressure so right. if kind of extrapolating what happens down here to what happens up there would be almost like unfair in my view because no 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 not unfair under... again which is why which is why i use the vacuum chamber above you right hey i'm, I'm not doing this by accident it wasn't just a funny little thing i came up with hmm. it's the exact same gravity the gravity in your room couldn't keep the air in your room so how does the the you know the gravity that's outside your room which is exactly the same you know, two feet from you outside the window, how does it keep the atmosphere on? And you say, well, it just does. It, that's where it really boils down to. Before, you know, you can read all you want on the internet. They're going to tell you the same thing. Well, it just does. It has to, because if it didn't, we'd be dead. And my follow-up is, I go, unless the other option you take into consideration, which is what? you're actually in a pressurized system, an actual pressurized system with a dome. 
with a you're in a building. Doesn't atmosphere atmospheric pressure make more sense? In fact, you're you're young. Doesn't the term greenhouse gases really only make sense if it's an actual greenhouse? Um, Didn't it ever bother you? It's like, oh yeah, when the fluorocarbons get up to a certain altitude, they just stay there and create a barrier. It's like, what? We, what do you mean? There's a vacuum of space. Oh no no no, ozone and fluorocarbons. That's why we don't have spray on de deodorant anymore. It's because it created this barrier and put holes in the ozone in Antarctica. It's like. What? <laughs> yeah, so um, I actually kind of didn't want to go into the scientific discussion, but honestly, I'm like kind of enjoying this. I think it's kind of fun to kind of do a little brain exercise and stuff yeah. here. Um, so I guess my kind of almost rebuttal to that uh, is kind of if we look at the like column of Earth's ocean, for example, uh, yeah. at the bottom, do you say there's arbitrary numbers? Probably not even close to correct, but like we just arbitrarily cast it as a QATM. And uh, as a measure of pressure, and at the top of the ocean's column, we categorize it as like one atm. So, if taking into account like the current scientific models that the general scientific community accepts, aka like the Earth is a globe model, um, as pressure increases as we get closer to the center of the Earth. If under the assuming you know the current generally accepted stuff we have, right? Gra so, gravity would be less, but pressure would be increased. Yes. 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 So, so if we go to the top of the Earth's atmosphere, atmosphere, it would be less pressure. And, and that would that almost would have a pe pressure, pressure gradient, gradient from, from the crust or the surface all the way up to the edge of the atmosphere. atmosphere. And so up to the, the edge of the atmosphere, atmosphere that's when that's pressure when equals very, very, very close to zero ATM, ATM which is the same thing as a vacuum. So it kind of is a gradient from one ATM, which is sea level, all the way up to zero ATM, which is yep. at the edge of the atmosphere. Yep. I, I absolutely. And, and that is textbook, exactly what you should have read. <laughs> Problem is, again, the box example, the vacuum doesn't care. If you, if you had, well, let's do a on the ground version of this. Mm -hmm. You have a three vacuum chambers in front of you side by side. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, you know, right, you know, real close to each other and the doors don't have to be big between them. But if you want to make them big, it probably help. <laughs> um, the, the far right, uh, the, the one on the far edge is a total vacuum. The one in the middle is got oh, one part per million. And then the one on the edge is, I don't know, um, general Earth atmosphere at, mm -hmm. I don't know, 500 feet right, above sea level. You open up those doors. Yes, if you open up the door between the, the first one and the second one, you know, the, 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 the vacuum and the one part per million, yes, mm -hmm. you're not going to have that much of a kick, right? Mm -hmm. But the second you open that third one, <laughs> the whole thing goes to hell. It just gets ripped because there's so much density in, on that third one, it's just going to push everything out of the way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to care. Again, it's the bleeding edge of space argument, which science just kind of glosses over. They say what you just said there. It's like, well, when you get up there, it's, it's almost no difference at all. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. but below that is all the pressure. That's where everything, and, and again, the vacuum doesn't discriminate. The, the vacuum, you're making a, a massive assumption that the vacuum is going to just, just be like, well, I've got these friendly, tiny little particles next to me. I don't really care about them so much. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to have that much of a pull on it. It's like, oh, yeah, because it's not going to, that's, again, we're talking about a gas versus liquid. You know, it would, if, you, if you're talking about the liquid. It's like particles moving around. I think it's like similar enough, I, I would say. Yeah, but again, the dense particles behind it. The cardboard box example, or you Wait, want to do a, si a sideways just... example. You have packing popcorn that's 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 in a big wall of packing popcorn, right? And behind that is a whole thing of marbles, mm -hmm. right? You pull that barrier between the packing popcorn and the marbles, those marbles are going to rip through the packing popcorn sideways and crush you. Mm -hmm. The packing popcorn is not going to stop them. And, and that's, we're talking about sideways, just momentum. Gravity, mm -hmm. same sort of deal. The gravity versus the vacuum of space. I mean, it's, it's not, I, I, I know I'm kind of bending your head here when I'm, when I'm saying this, because the physics books are only going to tell you one thing. They're going to say there's a bleeding edge of space. That's how mm -hmm. it works. That's how we don't die. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, I can show you tons of experiments on the ground. Uh, you want to look up a fun video, see how violent it really is? Look up a, a great little video on YouTube called um, uh, um, Vacuum versus Steel Rail Car. 
Oh, is that the one where they do the they make the pressure exactly like the tanker really really low? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, well, and you saw how quick it was though. I mean, we're talking about, and it's not even near to a pure vacuum field, and it's a steel, not aluminum rail car. That's a steel rail car, and it just crushes like a monster. Just mushed it with its hand. It's it's violent. It's really really fast. Again, I'm trying to get this to anyone that might be listening. It's not like the movies. I even had somebody <laughs> said said. To I mean, it's like, well, the ISS, I go, it's like, there's almost no difference between the, you know, there's no almost difference between the, the I actually had, had to hang up on them because <laughs> they said no difference between the pressure outside the ISS and the one inside. It's going, what are you talking about? You're claiming it's a pure vacuum outside and, and you're pressurized to what, 5,000 feet altitude inside? I go, and it's aluminum and plastic. Why isn't the ISS exploding? And, 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 the, and again, people say, well, there's not much of a pressure difference. I go, it's not like the movies. <laughs> I go, you open that bag again. What, anyone have, look up the 1986 movie Aliens and watch that <laughs> the last 10 minutes of Aliens. She opens up, and it's a huge airlock. The thing's got to be like 10 feet wide. She opens that thing up, and there's wind whipping by her. She's climbing up the ladder outside. It's like you, people are going, you know, going by her at 30 miles an hour. She's grabbing. It's like, no, no, you can look up. We do, you know, um, massive pressure. We've had horrible pressure accidents using um, deep sea submersibles and oil rigs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It is instant. It is, I mean, in a quarter of a second, it is over. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I think, I think kind of my next question, um, you know, I find discussion to be really engaging. You know, no matter what outcome we come out with, I think oh, it's still definitely cool. a, a fun thing to do. All right. Yeah. Um, but I guess my next question is that if we kind of take the same box system, so you have me box above me, and we go up to this, as you would, you, you would say theoretical, I would say real. Um, I'd say just for this case, if we assume it's real, the bleeding edge of space. So above me, the box is in a system at zero atm, pure vacuum, the box is in a vacuum. And then below me, where I'm at, it's at point like zero 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 one atm so barely any pressure so, so we're, we're right moving on that bleeding edge we're moving we're the moving the there. box to space yeah theoretically theoretically like if okay we, so so we just so the, teleport up there <laughs> okay so you okay so the, above you is a vacuum you're in the middle box and then below you is very low pressure no, no, the Earth the is Earth below us. So, so the Earth. Oh, the Earth is below you. Yeah. yeah. So why why do it in space? Why not do it here? Hmm? Oh well. Anyway, go ahead. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're kind of my argument would be that um, the gravity. You realize that's the space. You're talking about the space station at that point. No, not necessarily. So we're on the bleeding edge of space, and the pressure inside the box matches up with the pressure outside, and there is point like barely any pressure below me. It's important right. that the pressure is below. Oh, okay, okay, I got you, I got you. Yeah, so I guess my assumption would be that because gravity is pulling the air molecules down to the Earth, right, it wouldn't yeah. go up into the box because of the pressure differential, because the pressure, the pressure differential, like if the box was at a vacuum and it was surrounded by, you know, some pressure would be a different story, but because the box is surrounded by a vacuum, it wouldn't go into there. That would be kind of my assumption, kind of like my explanation for that. It's a nice it's thought. thought. No, no, <laughs> no. It doesn't. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter where you moved the boxes mm. to. Um, mm. As a matter of fact, let's take it. Let's take another one. Um, let's say you had. Oh, it's going to be tough to envision, but you could do it. Let's say you had a tiny little ball suspended in the middle of a vacuum chamber, and you had the ability to generate a tiny little puff of smoke around it, right? Gotcha. In the vacuum chamber, or outside the chamber. In inside the vacuum chamber, the okay. so the so the the ball would generate this tiny little puff of smoke. The okay. second that smoke was introduced to the system, it would dissipate. You'd never be able to have any smoke cling to that ball, even in a zero g environment, because the mm -hmm. vacuum would just rip it to shreds. It would it would because again. The, I mean, review but what here. if we increase the mass of the ball? That's my next question. <laughs> it does, it's all it's all relative. At that point, because you're saying, okay, fine, increase it to 8,000 miles wide. Fine, I'll, I'll see your 8,000 miles wide and, and give you a solar system that's billions of miles wide. And it's because that's what we're talking about but here. People, against this. Like 
billions or trillions of years then we take time into account or like add different variables like that extend the timeline ex- uh, change the ball's mass things like that well it, you can That's you my can next question person. well you can torque the mass all you want mm-hmm. but in the end and again most of this people miss and i'm glad I'm glad you're getting it most people miss this because yeah, if a vacuum the, the the problem the reason why the general public never quite caught on to the even the con most people don't even know the concept i've asked and i'm not trying to make fun of them they don't even understand the concept of a vacuum so for those of you listening the concept of a vacuum is this what we're breathing in what jason and i are talking in right now is basically a an invisible cloud it's like a thin version of water we're, we're in fact we're, we're breathing in and talking through 80 percent nitrogen and 20 percent oxygen and i know there's some trace gases and it's not exactly 80 20 but we're making it easy yeah, right we're not but it's 80 20 for this example so but it's but it's to our eyes because we have limited spectrum Mm -hmm. we can't see anything we can't see any of that it's invisible to us Mm -hmm. and we think it's absolutely transparent which actually works for the con game really really well so if you have a, a chamber that's what you know fully pressurized and then a chamber that's in a vacuum no person could ever tell the difference between the two right and and it's really important that you do know the difference between because in a vacuum there's nothing and that's the part that people don't get because it's like well there was nothing to begin with i'm talking to nothing it's like no you're not talking to nothing you're not breathing in nothing Mm -hmm. but in a vacuum chamber there's absolutely nothing there there's no nitrogen there's no oxygen there's no co2 there's there's nothing there's nothing there Mm -hmm. so when we're talking about the vacuum of space we're also talking about for all intents and purposes pretty much nothing Mm-hmm. And the pre- and thermal dynamics says that pressure, when put next to, it's the old saying that nature hates a vacuum, which is pressure next to non-pressure absolutely has to have a barrier. Absolutely has to, a physical barrier. Gravity is not a barrier. Gravity is, gravity is a force. Could a, what a physical, because I, I think uh, I'm trying to think back to chemistry. That was last year. And we learned about, uh, not, was it ideal gas law, stuff like that. Um, we were taught that, you know, pressure exerted a force outwards, you know, would you agree with that as well? Yes. So yes. if pressure is exerting a force outwards, what if we counteract that with another force? I, I guess that would Name be it. kind of Name gravity. It. Or... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know we're, we're kind of looping back on ourselves here when we're doing this. Or uh, just an arbitrary force, because I think... There is no arbitrary force. Getting into another discussion of like... I think this kind of almost loops back to the beginning. It's like things we can't like directly observe. If oh, well, oh, okay. Well, hey, well, so, well, no, let's let's go down gravity for a second because mm-hmm. science will tell you this. You can and the Toronto guys. I love this. Scientists will the good the open ones, the ones that aren't just t- totally hardcore. You know, why are you asking <laughs> that question? Scientists will tell you they can't tell you what gravity is. They can only tell you what it does. Because they can't replicate it. They can't artificially generate it. You know, artificial I mean, gravity. But, like, is that a bad thing? There are no, of, like, no. Unknown, but if you, you know? if you say it's a magical molecular force that pulls down to the center, things down to the center of a ball, mm-hmm. and I say it's a magical molecular force that pulls things straight down, although mm-hmm. I do think that density, if you're talking about a pressurized system, that density has a whole lot to do with it, meaning, you know, less mm-hmm. dense objects, you know, uh, rise, you know, everything, everything yeah. evens yeah. out based on density, especially when it comes to gas and or liquid, mm-hmm. uh, then... That's what we're talking about here. But when you introduce a vacuum, things get there's some assumptions made, hmm. some some big ones. And again, all because all the textbook nobody wants to go against. You know, remember when I said the peer pressure, the Ash experiment, mm-hmm. which is once that whole gravity thing was established, no one is going to go against it or even come up with an alternate theory, hmm. because how dare you? Why you know? It, which is why the flat Earth flat Earth says, oh yeah, it's just it's just pressurized doesn't have to be gravity it doesn't even have to be the major force here most mm-hmm. of it can be done with density and then gravity oh yeah an electro electromagnetic force or molecular force that pulls things down sure but it's not the only thing at least in my opinion and most of the people in my community mm-hmm. so i mean I, I get it i look i appreciate that you're that you're trying to you're trying to at least work your way through it mm-hmm. uh, but boy hell if you're gonna go up that thing where it's like okay well you took your room and you put it into space the ISS, a great example. I, I have had people, engineers, that have just 
destroyed the ISS in terms of it, he goes, there's no way it could do what they say it could do. Mm -hmm. Because it's like the, the pressure difference. Remember you said pressure pushes outwards, right? Mm -hmm. It also pushes inwards, like the, the case of the steel rail car. Mm -hmm. But the, it's also reverse, which is why, uh, you know, well, the pressure inwards, why submarines are so freaking thick. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're just huge, huge chunks of metal because yeah. the, the, you know, even they can't go down forever. They go down to 25,000 feet, they're done. Then it doesn't matter what, you know, the deep bathyscapes are, are, are symmetrically, you know, to where it pushes in and you can't crush it, more or less. Yeah. But the ISS, it's plastic and it's aluminum. So how is the pressure? You put anything in a vacuum chamber that's, um, that's light, and again, you can look up the experiments all day long on this, and they explode, everything. It, soft things go rigid. Uh, soda can, great, great example, because that's really all the ISS is, is a soda can. It, you know, full or not, just explodes. Mm. So why, you know, why does the ISS get away with what they did? Because most people don't understand. It's like, mm -hmm. look, it has to be steel reinforced. It has to be titanium. It has to be all these fun things. Mm -hmm. And no one's ever had an, an incident with that. They don't wear spacesuits. They never shut the doors. It should be like a submarine where people open and close the doors and spin the wheels between segments. Those doors are always open all the time. It's like, do you know how dangerous that is? I go a single micrometeor, again, if you believe in space, it, the size of a nickel would kill everybody. Nobody ever seems worried about anything, which is a whole other argument. It's like, why, you know, why the astronauts on the moon? There was never a, a panic transmission at any given point. And we never, by the way, have never lost an astronaut to, uh, to uh, suit malfunction or capsule malfunction or anything like that. Oh, yeah, we had a shuttle, you know, blow up. That was supposedly, you know, on launching another one on re-entry, but no one had any, you know, small problem. What, a suit never malfunctioned? <laughs> Ever? Sorry, I okay, ramble. Sorry. Go ahead. I'll leave, I'll leave that, that space shuttle one to the engineer people because I don't know if I'm qualified to talk on that. Well, there you go. Yeah, there I don't really go. want to, like, enrage anybody from there. If anyone wants to take that challenge up, you can contact uh, Mark, I guess. Oh, yeah, please. My email address is on in every, every yeah, video I make. Um, but I guess kind of going back... Uh, to like the things I personally feel a little bit more comfortable to talk about based off like my scientific exper experience because yeah. I'm definitely not a professional in any degree. Um, but I guess my next question in terms of like if we're going on to science pass is, you know, if the if it's a box and if we're assuming constant pressure throughout the box because, you know, gas in a box, that's what it does. It would dissipate into a constant pressure. Uh, yeah. Why do people, when they climb Everest, have to wear oxygen masks if the air atmosphere up there is thick? Oh, no, 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 no. It, it, that, that part you are right on, which is it's no different than water, meaning water has pressure starting, you know, you, you, you scuba dive, you go down 50 feet, you're fine, right? Mm -hmm. You go try to go down a few hundred feet, you better have some, some serious equipment with you because the pressure starts to build to where, as you know, when you get down to certain depths, yeah. uh, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, you'll, you'll crush anything we, we make. Um, no different. No different. So when you're down here, although it's, eh, it, it's kind of in reverse because of how we breathe and, you know, the oxygen we need, which is you don't even have to do the climb Mount Everest. You just use the, uh, the helicopter example. Helicopters at sea level, great. <laughs> You get up around 30,000 feet. I can't remember what the max is, the world record, but I think when you get around 30,000 feet, the rotors, there isn't enough to push down. Mm -hmm. So, But yes, it would get thinner. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's just how uh, gas, gas works in this case. Mm -hmm. But when you reach a certain point, it's got to, again, we say there's a barrier, and you know it gets, it gets lighter and lighter until it gets to the barrier, and it's as lightest near the barrier. Do I think it's a vacuum, complete vacuum up there? I doubt it. Uh, but uh, but there's got to be a barrier again thermodynamics if we're going with this barrier analogy um, yeah. you're saying that you know gas would dissipate in a box so if we put in a not not dissipate it would just weigh on itself meaning it's it's again like packing popcorn you know the the packing popcorn you know you, you load up packing pop, pack popcorn the the stuff down on the on the bottom would be compressed and then the stuff at the very the very top, it's barely hanging on by stack so electricity. I guess what is what is the force or what is the thing that's keeping it down? Like what causes you know this lighter air towards the barrier, and I guess the heavier air towards like I guess the center of this box. Oh well, and again, mentioned it a little earlier, but it's the combination of density and or again, I'm I'm one of those guys that actually believes in gravity. 
but I believe it only in the sense that it's not the all-encompassing, it's not the only force at play here. So again, the difference between my definition of gravity and science, mainstream science, would begin there. They say it's a magical molecular force that pulls things centered, down to the center of a ball. I think it's a magical molecular force that pulls things straight down to whatever, you know, to the, to the building floor. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you want to use the simulation theory, because, you know, I was in that industry for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the physics engine that we built. When we, when we build a, a physics engine, gravity is whatever the hell we say it is. Mm -hmm. and, we can, and we can apply it to anything we want. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not, uh, you, we, it's not, it's not this unified, I mean, granted, it's only numbers and all yeah. that, but it's, it's whatever we, we want it to be. And, but it acts just like what we have here. Mm -hmm. huh. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, let me, let me throw one. Since we're going in gravity thing, yeah. there's something I got to throw out there, which is the moon, right? Mm -hmm. the, the moon missions, which is, all right, so it's supposedly one sixth Earth's gravity, right? which means a 180 pound man would weigh 30 pounds which is fine right how they knew it was one six earth gravity don't know you know how they calculate the mass of the moon don't know it doesn't really matter the point is is why are they floating because 30 pounds is still 30 pounds as a matter of fact you wouldn't be moving in slow motion at all you'd be in fact you'd be faster because your muscles would be way overpowered for your body weight it would be like, uh, oh, is it the Mars, that Disney Mars movie, where the, the oh, crap, what was that name of the movie? I'm going to have to look. Taylor, Taylor Kitsch was in it. Anyway, where he was jumping around and, and you know, really great distances. Mm -hmm. You would have these amazing feats of strength, which they never showed. Your vertical leap would be amazing, but you mm -hmm. absolutely would not be moving in slow motion. Mm -hmm. In fact, you would be moving the opposite also because, remember, supposedly there's no atmosphere. So there's not even the soup to walk around in. But that's not what we say. It's like, oh, you drop it. Look, it's in slow motion. So why would it be in slow motion? It just weighs less. 30 pounds is still 30 pounds. It's not going to move slower. It's just, it's just weighs less, technically. That's all it is. So why, why doesn't anyone talk about it? The, again, the feats of strength, which we never, ever saw. I, the, the capsules. Mm -hmm. on, in fact, there was a guy that wrote me just the other day. He goes, wait a minute. He goes, it took that Saturn V rocket huge amounts of fuel to lift this thing there. But yet, mm -hmm. he goes, what rocket engine, what fuel did they even l use to get back up off the, um, off the surface of the moon? He goes, you would think it would be one-sixth at the very least, but it's like, we didn't see that. It was just this tiny little explosion, and all of a sudden, whee, just starts sailing off. Anyway, it's, it's a great camera technique. All they did in that case was they cut the film speed by 50%. And then everyone's like, oh, whoa, look, he's on the moon. He's floating. And every commercial, every movie after that's like, oh, everyone floats on the moon. Why, why, why did you assume that? Well, because it's, that's what NASA showed on their television. I guess my rational explanation for that, um, again, I'm going to put an apology out there for any like NASA engineers who worked on this. Uh, it wouldn't matter because you know, they weren't if we there. Assume, <laughs> if we assume it was real, you know, uh, right. apologies to people. If we assume it was real who worked on this and I get this wrong. I uh, just want to put that out there. Don't want to make any enemies, but uh, I guess my impression of, you know, my rational explanation would be almost a range of motion they had, seeing as, you know, if we, from your point of view, called these suits theoretical, um, the range of motion would be pretty poor considering, you know, if we were... Oh, the, put, suit, the suits themselves. Yeah, so it would re restrict the range of motion so they couldn't move all that much, but they could still... That's why you don't see them jumping like 10 feet up in the air because they couldn't get a full, they couldn't like bend their knees down. Ooh, goodness, like, okay, okay. Down, you know, and then do a full jump like Michael Jordan. Uh, they can only kind of like bounce around and kind of looking at the footage, I think kind of supports that notion. Okay, well again, you're making an assumption, but let's go down that road, which is one, it's one of my points. In fact, I made several videos along these lines, and that is how does the spacesuit not become a basketball? Meaning you put any soft object with any air inside it in a vacuum chamber. And this is 100% put in a certificate you can frame, you can watch this all day long. Mm -hmm. it, they all just go completely rigid and they explode. Basketball, football, volleyball, stretch arm strong, anything that's pressurized, if it's mm -hmm. soft, will, will go rigid and explode. There's only one object that has never gone rigid and exploded, a soft object that, that was put in any sort of vacuum environment. It was the spacesuit. Which is why I have asked, I've asked for years, no one will tell me. It's, in fact, it is my challenge. I go, okay, what magical thing, <laughs> I'm assuming it's something from Lord of the Rings, 
What magical thing is in that backpack that keeps your suit somewhat flexible? Like you were saying, it has articulation points. They can move their elbows and their finger. I mean, their fingers. They can they can move their knees to a certain degree. Why isn't that suit absolute? Why isn't it a parade float? What technology? And no one, no one will touch this. What technology is in that backpack that stops the vacuum of space? That makes it immune from from the vacuum? And uh, from what I saw, I, I don't really know that much about like the mechanics. Are you are you actually going to go to the television footage on this one? You're going to oh, say no, 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 from no. what I, I saw. No, no, no. I I was going to go to actually um, the new suits NASA made. Uh, their articulation points, they're not flexible like fabric, like, you know, the shirts you have, but they're actually like, uh, I don't know really how to describe this. I remember seeing the video, but uh -huh. it's kind of like, a, like two rings that like slide against each other. So the articulation points are actually like rigid. Right. So I guess that would kind of explain because there isn't any. It's, it's the layers here. argument. Yeah. Sorry, my winter coat has layers. The only thing it stops is the cold. A basketball has layers. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's that the, the points themselves, like if we're assuming how you said that soft objects in a uh, vacuum would go rigid and explode, um, yeah. I'm saying that the articu articulation points themselves, at least on these new NASA suits, I can't speak on the old ones, but from what I saw in the YouTube video I saw, um, yeah. the articulation points themselves are hard. They're like... Uh, plastic uh, they're they're metal but okay this just, just so, something rigid and hard which, which is, like rotates which is fine what mm -hmm. what happened with the the old suits i could show you a montage of suits some of them look like motorcycle leathers so what what happened why they change them why they just keep getting bigger and bigger didn't the old ones work perfectly they I mean, keep ch changing these suits to this radical i know you don't know uh, but yeah. but but it's but it's but it's some of the and I don't expect you to answer it actually. Anyone's listening, I'm not expecting you to answer. But it's these questions that we throw out there mm -hmm. that that again have been assumed for so long mm -hmm. that no one comes back and with I mean, most of the time it's like, well, what are you talking about? We saw it. It's like people here's here's the thing for you. Here, here's mm -hmm. my here's my theory. You ready? So you can look this up. The old pre-launch the stuff the suits they were working on before they actually supposedly went to space mm -hmm. were exactly that they were metal solid metal and plastic mm -hmm. they looked like b movie robots i mean these were things were and they were huge they were clunky and they realized it's like yeah there's no way we're going to get into any sort of decent you know the spaceships would have to be huge for these i mean not only that but it's like how are we going to get these guys in a ladder <laughs> It's, they're horrible. I mean, they're, they're, they were really, really big. And then somebody came along and they said, I mean, and at the last minute, th somebody came along and said, because that's all they were testing in. They said, you know what? Let's just go with soft suits. And they're like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, nobody knows anything about physics. We'll just use soft suits. No one will, no, no one will pick up on it. And, and anyone that is physics, the, we can just give them any answer. Any answer that we say it is, they're just going to run with it. It's like, well, NASA came up with blah, blah, blah. <laughs> If if this was true, we should have in the archives thousands, thousands of hours of vacuum footage, people in a vacuum, right? People in, we should see training rooms with astronauts jumping around multiple ones in vacuum chambers. We never, ever see it. The only thing the astronauts train in, which just blows my mind, is they train in a swimming pool was the exact opposite of what you would train in. Because remember, the pressure is you know, coming in from the outside mm -hmm. at that point. Why are you training in a swimming pool? Why aren't you training in a vacuum chamber? It's, it's just stunning to me. And when every once in a while, yes, I will see a, like, just a few minutes of somebody in a vacuum chamber. But you remember, mm -hmm. no one can tell the difference between a vacuum chamber and a non-vacuum chamber. So, and, which is, okay, we'll, we'll end this part with this which is I put out a challenge to, to the scientific community years ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, you want, to, you want to shut me down? You want me to not talk about this anymore I go, and, and not put me on a spaceship? Fine. Loan me. Don't have to give it to me. Just loan me any spacesuit from any era because they all worked absolutely perfectly. <laughs> Amazing. And backpack. None of this, this tethered G-force suit crap. Put me in a vacuum chamber and pull the switch and tell me that you know how it works. Tell me how I don't die. And you're saying, well, you wouldn't even know if you were in a vacuum chamber. I go, yeah, I would, because proving a vacuum chamber is extremely easy. You do it with three objects, cost you all four bucks. 
right? One would be a balloon that's partially blown up because that thing's going to expand like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. Two would be a just a cup of tap water. Just put it on the on the sill because, as you know, tap water boils in in a vacuum mm -hmm. at room temperature. Mm -hmm. And the third would be a bell because remember, in a vacuum, you can't hear anything because there's no way where for the sound. You know, the old bell experiment. You know, this, mm -hmm. the sound just goes. There's nothing nowhere for it to go. And no one, no one has even, no one's even come close to touch. I haven't gotten a proposal. This thing has been out there for years. Sorry, I'm going to harp on the vacuum thing forever because it, it is assumed, it is glossed over, and everyone just thinks, oh, this is how a vacuum works. It's like, no, you don't know how it works. You, you fill in the gaps from the movies. You fill in the gaps from what science tells you. Science says, oh, here's, here's, here's where the bleeding edge of space is, and here's where our atmosphere is still. Again, what you said, oh, well, gravity that's the only answer you got. It's like, we just say it's something much simpler. It's like, no, it's a ceiling. It doesn't have to be gravity. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. I think, honestly, I feel like a lot of what you talked about almost, hmm, I don't want to say this in a way that enrages the scientific community. Say it. <laughs> but, uh, just say it. you're not you, you're, you're not, not working on your you're not even in, you're not even university yet this is not going to stop you from getting just into a college you... to the scientific community if any of you guys are offended by this a is it's, it's my personal view <laughs> just want to put that out there but i feel like this movement captures a lot of the spirit of science in terms of like you're very inquisitive you're very questioning you you ask questions about a lot of things yes uh, which i find like really fascinating because i'm gonna be honest coming into this um i had the impression that the flat earth community was very very ignorant I i'm gonna be fully candid about that but you um, wouldn't be the first yeah but I, I find it really interesting how there you guys are very very inquisitive in that manner but um i guess one of the main kind of differences is that uh, a lot of the scientific community hmm, I just find it very interesting that both sides of the argument hold a lot of like similar values in terms of like you both want to understand the world more in some way or another. Yes. Uh, but you both have arrived at different answers for it, uh, which is really, really interesting. And I think on one side, and I think, you know, this is going to be like the i think maybe like second or third time we possibly cycle back to this but it's almost like a divide in what you can what your five senses perceive and what kind of is right. theoretical and what we can extrapolate based off of different experience we've done, different experiments we've done in putting them together because obviously you've never put a box at the bleeding edge of space and put something uh, under it and saw how pressure interacts but a lot of the science behind it is different experiments and saying how one, like one force, for example, interacts with another force. And if we put it in this specific type of system, we can apply this knowledge and this other knowledge and have it be there. Well, I think a lot of like the kind of flat earth community is almost like we see this part. You take it almost like once, I feel like there's less extrapolation in the point. Like, I'm not saying like extrapolating things is a good or bad thing, but it's very like, one thing correlates with another while a lot of the scientific stuff and even like in classes it's you put multiple components of science together it's kind of the impression i'm getting and oh goodness my computer went black again because it's going to sleep please don't uh -oh. touch computer <laughs> but um man because obviously I don't want to like denounce you and your views, you know, because this is obviously I, you can. <laughs> I uh, it's all right. I've had I've had all all types over the last six years. But go ahead. <laughs> well, for me personally, um, I still kind of side with the side of uh, traditional science. Sure. Um, I mean, we have different views, but you know that's okay. Uh, that's why we're here today to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, but I just find it so interesting that like the spirit itself is very very similar. Yeah, yeah, it I yeah, I which is again frustrating for us because mm. we're coming in. It's kind of like the the annoying kids in the science class at the back <laughs> of the room. They keep raising their hands. Mm. And what eventually it happens, you've seen this in in television and movies and real life where it's like, yeah, yeah, enough questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Just just whatever I say on the blackboard, that's what's right. <laughs> and and 
again, because it's school, you don't question it, right? It's, well, it's, it's, you know, it's the curriculum. It is what, what we know to be sure. And, we, you know, conformity builds empires. I get that. Mm -hmm. The spirit, though, is absolutely the same, which is we want to know more. And if we don't like the answer, or if we can't prove, prove the answer to ourselves, or again, it's, it's an answer that, that, it's, that, that we don't have access to, you know, it's like, well, only an astronaut knows that for sure. It's like, yeah, but those are all military officers. <laughs> and <laughs> as you know, they never lie about anything ever. <laughs> and they're part of the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. So you, again, well, I'll give you I'll give you a great example. And I, I don't know how much longer you want to go. But mm -hmm. that's, here, here's a question. So Fox News, there was a, a commentator on there. Mm -hmm. Her name was uh, Dana Perino. Mm -hmm. And she had this great quote, which was because they're asking her, you know, about, oh, do you think the moon mission was real? And she, without even hesitating, now granted, she was a press secretary for a while for like one of the Bushes. But she mm -hmm. says, I believe in the moon mission because I'm a patriot. And that was pretty much and that's that's an attitude which I have seen out there, which is like whatever the government says is true. Mm -hmm. It's true. They would. It's not that you you know you don't think they might steer you wrong. I have faith in that. It's like yeah, we're looking for something a little more objective than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if there's something out there that and remember we come from the conspiracy world, so we think that there's a lot of stuff out there. Again, we let me let me wrap this up with this. We all it all comes down to what you're comfortable with and what you're not. We all know there's conspiracies out there. Again, in business and politics and sports and entertainment and journalism there's all sorts of conspiracies the definition of conspiracy on its own is that three or more people are conspiring together to commit something either illegal or unethical there's your conspiracy right it happens mm -hmm. all the time it's only a question of what you're willing to look at and what you're not and for a lot of people it's like okay i'm willing to look at pearl harbor but i'm not willing to look at 9-11 or I'm willing to look at this, or I'm not willing to look at that. And this is the biggest one. I mean, this is this is the toughest one to get around because it's so huge. And again, which is why that this and it goes against massive institutions mm -hmm. out there that have built their these huge foundation walls on a scientific observation. And we're not trying to tear down the whole thing. However, <laughs> if if there's a part of it that's wrong. We can't just ignore it. We're not going to ignore it because it's like, well, we should probably let that one go. Like, nope, nope. We're gonna, we're gonna call. We're gonna call it, and that's just one of the things we do. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, hey. I, you know, I think this conversation was really interesting because, you know, personally, I still haven't changed my view, but like, in terms of my view of the community at large, definitely yeah. has changed. You know. Well, good. Like, like. Even though I don't agree with you guys, I, you guys are people. You guys, you know, are similar to me in a way where, you know, we all want to understand the world a little bit more. Right. And while our interpretations of it, you know, are very different, uh, I think it's just still kind of encouraging to see that people are still people. You know, we're all curious, you know, in one way or another. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Again, the curiosity. You know, we, we want to know stuff. Uh, and we're, we're hoping, you know, we're just looking for better... You want the short version? We were looking for better answers. Mm -hmm. That's that's what there what that what is out there. And if there are, and I'm a huge believer of good writing, meaning mm -hmm. I will if if a movie, you've done the same thing. It's like if a movie has enough plot holes in it, you're gonna turn it off. It's like <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not watching this anymore. It's just got too silly or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's what we do. It's like you know we're looking at this and now we're finding you know, story inconsistencies with things that shouldn't be stories that, that, that are real life and, and we're questioning them. And we, yeah, we get pushback. The pushback from science is you shouldn't question them. We know better. We're the authority. You shouldn't question us. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't sound like a movie. I don't know what does. And it's like, okay, fine, dystopia. You, you, can, you can do that, but we're, you know, the more you push back at us, the more you think we think that there's something else going on. And it's become cyclical. Anyway, anything else? Any other closing remarks? Yeah, I just want to end with the last question, I guess, is almost like the signature question of the podcast almost. But uh, sure. between you and I or just people in general, you think that believe and don't believe in the flat earth, what do you think is a common denominator between them or something that, you know, they both agree on or a value that they both hold? I think 
in the end, everybody wants to know the truth. There's an old saying that people are suckers for the truth. However, there's an old political saying in the United States, which is that only give the public as much truth as they can handle. So, we're, yeah, that, if you want the similarities, that's what we're trying to we're trying to do. We're willing to absorb more truth than other people that are out there. However, the other look, science they want to know the truth as well. Do sometimes things get in the way? Yes, science has to deal with politics. Science has to deal with money issues. Science has to deal with all sorts of stuff. We kind of look past that and say, okay, here's what we see it as. You know, is it possible that, you know, there could be, you know, we, there, we could be some common ground. We're reaching up, but science is not reaching down. So that's where the, the common denominator stop, you know, stops. Mm -hmm. They're looking for truth. We're looking for truth. But they see us as the, uh, the troublemakers of the classroom. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's a great I think that's a great place to end. Thank you again okay. for uh, coming on and having this conversation. Yeah. A lot longer than I expected, but it was definitely. <laughs> and that happens, fun. by the way. <laughs> that happens. Every Everybody that says, oh, yeah, we'll do an interview for 30 minutes, I'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to happen. Yeah. But, but it, uh, it was a lot more fun than I thought as well. Oh, good. You know? I, th I thought it was a good experience, you know. Well, we still don't necessarily agree, I think we can, we, we know a little bit more about each other in terms of like our views. Exactly. Well. I hate you now more than I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> that, that gets you off the hook, by the way. That, that'd be, you know, the science people like, oh, good, he hated you. <laughs> so. All, right. All right. Well, cool. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure talking with you. I hope it goes well. And uh, shoot me the audio when you can. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man.